I want to thank everyone for the prayers that you've uh, made for my wife. Uh, she's turned a corner in the last 24 hours and has gone from someone who's extremely weak. She's still weak, still not even close to hitting on all cylinders, but today whenever she smiles, uh, the smile reaches her eyes. She's got a little gleam in her eye today, and I'm thankful for that. I thank you for your concern. Thank you for your prayers, and uh, I appreciate I appreciate so very much your kindness. I want to just uh, talk to the church tonight. Uh, talk about where we are, and not not just in this local church, but where we are, and how we fit, how the church fits in the world that uh, we find ourselves in. We are, we are in a historical moment. We're living in fascinating times. We're living in a time that in the future, uh, our children and our grandchildren are gonna read about in history. Uh, the world has in the past seen plagues. Uh, you can read the history and, and you can uh, you can read and study how that there has been attempts to overthrow governments before. Uh, there, in the past, in our history, have been people who have been greedy for power and people who have been greedy for money. That has all happened in our past. There has been riots in the past. There has been financial uncertainty in our history. But I think you would be hard-pressed to find a time in modern history where all of this has happened at the same time, where we've had all of this unrest, the plagues, the, the attempt to overthrow governments, the riots, the financial uncertainty, is all taking place at the same time. There's so much racket. There's so much commotion that it's, it's difficult to remain calm. There's so much commotion and racket that it's, it's difficult to remain focused on, on your personal priorities. It's, it's difficult to maintain and, and hold on to direction in your life because there's so much pulling at us. There's so much grasping and clawing for our attention and not only for our attention but for our allegiance. And... Uh, there's so many voices, and they, they have agendas. These voices are screaming and telling us what is wrong with the world and telling us what should be done with the world and telling us who to blame for all of our trouble and that they have the answer and that if we would listen to them, that it would solve the problem and it would fix what has got them so upset. All of these voices, all of these groups have an agenda. And large masses of people have attached themselves to these agendas. And so uh, when you witness all of this unrest, when you witness all of this dishonesty and this manipulation, and dis it's a disruption to your life. When you see all this disruption going on, it's easy to fear. It's easy to have strong opinions. It's easy to get angry. It's easy to hate. When all of this racket is going on and it disrupts your life, there there's, seems to be a need to respond, to respond in kind, to respond as we see it. It's, it's, it's easy to forget that although we live in this world and although we live for us we live in America it's easy to forget that you have been born again it's easy to forget that there was a time there was a place where you repented of your sins you died to this world you repented of your flesh, you repented of 
your lifestyle. You repented and you were baptized. You were buried. And all of your sin was washed away. You, you were buried. You died to this world and you were buried to this world. And God filled you with His Spirit. And when that happened, there was a birth. There was a something that was born that didn't exist before. You became a citizen of God's kingdom. You became a citizen of another world. And the events around you, they affect you. There's no question about that because your flesh lives in this world and all of the the stuff that's going on does interfere with the life that you live in the flesh. But it doesn't affect you on the same level as it affects the average American citizen. The Democrats have an agenda. The Republicans have an agenda. Black Lives Matter has an agenda. Center of Disease Control has an agenda. Conservatives have an agenda. The liberals have an agenda. And we need to understand that although they have their agendas, that's not the only agenda that's going on. That's not, they're not the only ones that have a goal for this world. They're not the only ones that have a desire for change in this world. God also has an agenda. And when God came into this world in the form of a man, when he came in the form of Jesus Christ, it was no secret that he came to establish his kingdom. He came to establish another kingdom. He came to establish the kingdom of God. We read in Mark chapter 1 verse 14. Now after, the, after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. The kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus preached the kingdom. That, he had a, that God has a kingdom. He had a kingdom. The kingdom of God is here, he's saying. We find in Matthew chapter 6 verse 33. Where Jesus says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God. There's a lot of things we desire. There's a lot of things we want. And he discussed those things prior to this, this particular verse. But he made it clear that if you will seek the kingdom of God first. And you seek the righteousness of God first. All these other things that you think you need. All these other things that you desire. If you seek God's kingdom first. Those things that you desire in the world will be added to you. Take therefore no thought for tomorrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is evil thereof. There's going to be a mess going on. The every day, every day, tomorrow. All of it has got its own evil. All of it's got its own issues. All of it is filled with people and, and groups that's got their agenda. But if you will seek the kingdom of God first. That will guarantee that God will be involved in your life and the things that you need in this life he will see to it that you get seek first the kingdom the kingdom the kingdom and Jesus was standing before Pilate and he did not he did not look like a king he he did not look like a man of power he did not look like a man of authority but there was something about Jesus as he stood before Pilate bleeding as he stood before Pilate with his beard plucked and his back beaten, as this beaten human body stood before him, there was something about Jesus that Pilate recognized that even in his beaten form that he wasn't just another man. He wasn't just an average man. He wasn't ordinary. He, he recognized that Jesus was over, he wasn't sure what kind of kingdom, but he knew he was over a kingdom. Pilate knew he 
didn't fully grasp who Jesus was. Pilate knew that he didn't fully grasp what Jesus was. He knew that he didn't fully grasp the kingdom of God or the kingdom that Jesus was over. But he knew he was over a kingdom. And whenever he had him crucified because he was a politician and he wanted the goodwill of the people, he made a choice, he made a decision that he knew was wrong. And he was compelled to declare to the world that Jesus was a king. And he wrote it and nailed it to his cross. John chapter 19, verse 19, and Pilate wrote a title and he put it on the cross. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Pilate didn't fully understand everything about Jesus and about his kingdom, but he knew he was over some kind of kingdom. God's kingdom is spiritual. God's kingdom is not just of this world. It's spiritual. But the beautiful thing is, is that God made his kingdom so that people of this world can be a part of his kingdom. Although his kingdom is spiritual, we who are born of flesh, we who are human, can be born into the kingdom of God. John chapter 3 verse 3. And Jesus answered and said unto him. Verily, verily I say unto thee. Except the man be born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. He keeps talking about the kingdom of God. That God has another kingdom. That God has got a kingdom of his own. And Nicodemus said unto him. How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus said, Verily, verily I say unto thee, except a man be born of the water and the Spirit. We talked just a little bit earlier about being baptized in the water, being washed of our sins, die into this flesh, being born of the water and of the Spirit. He cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh, Whatever a human being gives birth to is going to be flesh. But that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And when we are born again, when God fills us with His Spirit, that that comes to life in us is not just another fleshly thing, but we become a spiritual being. We are a part of a spiritual kingdom. And Jesus came into this earth to recruit people to be a part of, of his kingdom. Now Isaiah saw heaven. He had a vision, or somehow or another, he was able to get a view of heaven. We read about that in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings. With two of those wings, he covered his face, and with two of those wings, he covered his feet, and with two of those wings, he did fly. And these seraphims, one cried unto another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, and the whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Angels were gathered around that throne. Isaiah saw the throne, and he saw angels gathered around the throne, crying, Holy, holy, holy. Then in Revelation, John sees the throne also. He sees the same seraphims, only he calls them beasts, but he describes the same thing that Isaiah saw. And the four beasts, each of them had six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and, the, and they rest not day or night, saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty, which was and which is and which is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks unto him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever. But that's, that's not all that John saw. 
when the world was finished, when time was finished, and John is looking at heaven after time is over, after the world is over, he's looking at heaven then. He sees the seraphims, or what he calls beasts, and they, just like Isaiah, they're still there day and night. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. But that's not all he saw. In verse 10, he sees four and twenty elders, or he sees twenty-four elders that fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. There's twenty-four elders that are there at the throne. They have received their crown from God, but now they are casting their crowns back to the feet of God, recognizing that they didn't deserve to be there. The only reason they were there is because God made it possible, that God allowed them and made it possible for them to be born again, that God had made it possible for them to be born of the Spirit and to become the kingdom of God, not just of this world, not just surrounded by the things of this world, but they had become a part of something bigger, something greater, something that was eternal. And now they... they they cast their throne, their crowns at the throne and recognize that it is because of him that they are there and they worship him and they glorify him. It's amazing that 24 people could make it to the throne room. The 24 people, but Isaiah saw angels, they, he saw seraphims flying and worshiping. But when we get to the end of time, it's not just angels, but John sees people in the throne room of God. He sees people in the throne room of the King of Kings. He sees people in the throne room of the Almighty God. But he goes on to write in Revelation chapter 7 verse 9. It's amazing that there's even 24 human beings that can make it to the throne room of Almighty God. But in chapter 7 verse 9. After this I beheld and lo a great multitude which no man could number. Of all nations, of all kindreds and people. They're from all tongues, and they stood before the throne. It's not just angels now. Isaiah saw only angels, but when John sees the throne, and he's projected into the future to the end of time, where people are in heaven, it's it's not just angels anymore, but people have made it to the throne room. Jesus has recruited a multitude that can't be numbered, that have been born again. Their sins have been washed away, and now they are a part of the kingdom of God. It wasn't just something that Jesus talked about when he was in the earth. It was something that he meant. It's real. It's for sure. It's not just pie in the sky. When Jesus said there's a kingdom of God, he was serious. When he talked about people being involved, and a part of the kingdom of God. He was serious. The kingdom of God. You have the option. You have the opportunity as a human being to be a part of God's kingdom. It's real. It's just as sure as the chair you're sitting in. The kingdom of God is real. And so... The church must remain focused. You and I must remain focused. We've got to understand that there's more to this life than just what we're dealing with right now. It's not just you and I working jobs and drawing paychecks and 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 paying our bills and having children and, and dying when we get old. That, that's not all there is to it. In fact, Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 19, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, 
We are of all men most miserable. But it's not just this life we've got hope. God gives us hope in this life. He promised that he would be with us. He promised that he'd never leave us. He promised he'd never forsake us. That's a beautiful promise. But if that's all the hope we had, it wouldn't be enough. But now we've got a hope that we're part of a kingdom of God that is eternal and it continues to go on after this life it continues to go on after we breathe our last breath the kingdom of God lives on after this world is over the world around us is in turmoil the world around us is squabbling the world around us is fighting for a piece of the power. Everybody's jostling to get into position to be a part of, of a, some kind of kingdom in this world. I want to talk to you tonight and encourage you tonight. Don't allow yourself to, to get caught up in their mess. Don't allow yourself to get caught up in the squabbling and, and all of the fear and the jostling that's going on in the world around you. You are a child of God. You are a part of God's kingdom. You are God's child. And God is in control. And God has an agenda. All these other voices have an agenda, but the one who's in control of everything also has an agenda. And he talked about that with his disciples in Matthew chapter 24. He had made some comments and they recognized that he was discussing the end of the world, the end of time. And in verse 3 of chapter 24, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming in the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, and see that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and there shall be pestilence and there shall be earthquakes in diverse places. All of these things are the beginning of sorrows. It's just the start of all the hardship that the world is going to endure. And they shall, and then they shall deliver you to be afflicted. And they shall kill you and they shall, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom, the kingdom, he's not Finish talking about the kingdom. He, everything leads him back to the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. Then shall the end come. We can't focus on what the world is doing. You'll have a stroke thinking about what all the world is doing that's not our job to worry about what the world is doing. Our job is to enlarge the kingdom. Our job, if you are a part of the kingdom of God, your job, my job, is to enlarge the kingdom. Make the kingdom larger. Preach the gospel to anybody and everybody that we can. Those that are in the world are going to do what those in the world do. They're going to be immoral. They're going to fight. They are going to exer exercise dominion over one another. There's always going to be fighting. In the world, there's always going to be fighting. But Jesus said, even though the world's got that going on, it shall not be that so among you. You are not to get involved in the fighting, not to get involved in the squabbling, but you're to serve everybody you can serve. That's what my kingdom does. The second coming of Jesus Christ is not predicated on 
the Antichrist, when the Antichrist shows up, and what the Antichrist does. That's not what's going to determine when Jesus Christ comes. World powers are not going to determine when Jesus Christ comes back. Jesus said that when my gospel of the kingdom is preached to every nation, when my gospel is preached to all the world, then the end will come. It's not the Antichrist that's going to decide the coming of Jesus Christ. It's going to be the church that decides the coming of Jesus Christ. And it's, we've got to get going. We've got to get doing what the kingdom of God is supposed to do. It's not time for you and I to wring our hands and wonder how we're going to survive. You're going to survive because you're a child of God. You're going to make it because you're a child of God. But what's important is for you and I to do what God has called us to do at the very end, the very last words that Jesus said before he was ascended up into heaven is go ye, go ye, go ye into all the world and preach and preach and preach. It's the will of God to save the lost. It's the will of God to reach the lost. It's the will of God to save the world. It's the will of God to recruit people into his kingdom. And it's our job. It's your job to not just sit on our couches and wonder how are we going to survive. Our job is to reach people. To reach people. To save people. Amen. That's the purpose of the church in this time when the church has reached the world then Jesus Christ can come back then the end of time will come when the world has been reached and then we read in 2nd Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14 if my people which are called by my name. He's not talking to people out in the world. He's talking to his people. People that is called by his name. If these people that are mine, if these people that are part of my kingdom, if these people that, that are identified with my name, if these people will humble themselves, if these people will pray, if these people will seek my face, and if they will turn from their wicked ways, I'll hear them, and I'll forgive them of their sins, and I'll heal their land. We know how to pray prayer requests. We know how to pray prayers of thanksgiving. We know how to pray proclamations and declare the word of God says thus and so, and I declare thus and so, and I believe thus and so, and I speak thus and so. We know how to make those kind of, we know how to pray prayers of praise. But it's time for the church. It's time for me. It's time for you to pray a prayer of humility. It's time for you, it's time for me, it's time for the church, it's time for this church to pray a prayer of repentance, to align ourselves with the Spirit of God, to align ourselves with His desire, with His purpose. This became clear to me this past week. As I watched a clip of people praying. I don't know where they were, but they were out in the open, they were in public, and they were praying. And there was a man with an air horn on an aerosol can walking through these praying people, blasting that horn, blasting that horn, doing everything that he could to disrupt their praying. They continued to pray, and he continued to blast and then I watched him as he, he put his face right in the face of an individual that was praying. And he said, you and your cross are going to get a whooping. Now, I'm not proud of the thoughts that I thought. I thought thoughts that I'm embarrassed when I heard that man threaten an individual who was doing nothing but praying. And so I talked to God about my thoughts. I said, God, I don't know where those thoughts came from. 
Well, I do know where they came from. They came from out of my fleshly thinking. They came out of my human nature. I know where my thoughts came from. They came from out of me. How can I change those thoughts? I know that what I thought and what I wanted to happen and, and what I felt like should happen, I knew that that's not, that's not what was pleasing to the Lord. How can I think different? God just began to speak into my heart. And he asked this question. How much pain did that man, has he endured in his lifetime? How much abuse did he endure as a child? How much rejection has he experienced in a lifetime? How much disruption, dysfunction has he gone through in his life that would cause him to behave like that? And instead of seeing that man as an end product, as a threat to a praying individual, God helped me to see him as someone who, who had endured something that possibly no human should endure. He's experienced a lot of pain to make him hate that much. He's experienced a lot of rejection to make him that angry. And Jesus came to love people. For God so loved the world. So loved the world. And so if that's what Jesus came to do was to love people. And if I am going to be a part of Jesus' kingdom, then somehow or another I have got to allow His love to flow through me. Somehow or another I've got to allow Jesus Christ to be able to love people through me. If I respond out of my flesh, it's going to be, it's going to respond in kind. You threaten a praying man, I'm a praying man, then you threaten me and this is what needs to happen to you. That doesn't come from God's Spirit. That came from out of my flesh. But Jesus said, I've come to love people. My greatest job, my job as a, a member of the kingdom of God is to love people. In spite of the chaos, in spite of the pain, in spite of the agendas, in spite of the hatred, in spite of all that's going on around me, I cannot afford to get caught up in that tornado. I cannot afford to get caught up in the spirit of this world. I, I've got to remain focused in the spirit of God. I've got to remain focused in God's agenda. He's got an agenda, and that's to love people. He's got an agenda, and that's to recruit people, to get them into His kingdom, to be a part of that nation, to be a part of that great multitude without number that's around the throne in that great day. It's my job to help make sure there's more people around the throne than what there is now. Hell... Pastor, you don't know what they said. You don't know what they've done. I don't know about your situation, but let's just look at Jesus. He's the one who's the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the one that we're to look to. Jesus is hanging on the cross. He's dying. He's dying so that you and I could be baptized in His name and have our sins washed away. He's dying so that we could be filled with His Spirit. He's dying because He loves people. And while He's dying, while He's gasping for air, the man to his side just simply asked Jesus to remember him when he got to his kingdom. When you get to your kingdom, please remember me. And Jesus, he didn't say this exactly, but this is what he said. Is, I'll do better than that. I want you to be, join me today in my kingdom. Today you'll be with me in my kingdom. He was recruiting right up to the very end. He was reaching for lost people right up to the end. And when he was just about out of air... When he was just about out of strength. When he was just about out of time. The last words he says is, Father, 
Forgive them. Because they don't know what they're doing. Don't know what they're doing. They're screaming. They're spitting. They've been beating you. They've been ripping your beard out of your face. They've been chanting for your death for the last few hours. They're laughing and mocking at you now. And even in the middle of all that mess and all that noise, Jesus is saying, forgive them. That came out of love. That didn't come out of my nature. That didn't come out of my, my flesh. But out of Jesus Christ was the desire to forgive people that were hurting him. To forgive people that were killing him. To forgive people whose hot spittle was running down his body at that very moment. None of them was asking for forgiveness and yet he forgave them anyway. Church, we're living at a crucial time. We're living at an important time in history. It is for this time that the church exists. We have crossed some lines. And as I've told you in the past, I haven't been preaching and you've never heard me preach anything about the end time because I'm not comfortable with preaching about stuff that you can't prove. I feel like that everything in prophecy is a, a way of marking, okay, we pass that and we pass that and we pass that to give us an idea where we are. We passed a lot of mile markers in the last four months. We're very close to the end of time. A world government is just around the corner. The mark of the beast is just around the corner. They're already talking about things to where you can't do business if you don't take certain, certain precautions. They're already talking about a cashless society to where you can't buy or sell unless you utilize the digital form of cash. All of it's coming together. You're living in it. You're living in it. So what is the church to do? Wring our hands and worry? No, you're a part of another kingdom. You don't have hope in this life only. You're a part of something huge. You're a part of something great. You're a part of something that's God's. And He loves people. And people will do stupid stuff. But we're still required to love them. We're still required to reach for them. We're still required to not judge and not hate and not be full of anger. But our response Responsibility is to reach for people, reach for people, love people. If ever, if ever you've had a love for people or a desire to reach for people, now is the time to do something about it because we're running out of time. We're running out of time. Jesus came preaching a kingdom. And you are a part of the kingdom. The kingdom of God. Not just the kingdom of America, the kingdom of Canada, the kingdom of Texas. You're the part of the kingdom of God. And we live by different rules. We have different purpose. We have a greater purpose. We live according to God's agenda. And that's the seeker to save the lost. That is to love anyone and everyone. Whether they treat us right or not, that's, that's not the criteria. Our example is Jesus on a cross forgiving. Our example is Jesus on a cross telling a man that has never done one thing and would never do one thing for the kingdom. He was on the cross because he was a criminal. He was never going to be able to do anything to benefit Jesus Christ. And yet, he saved him anyway. That's our example. So, we can continue to pray prayers of praise. We can continue to pray prayers of thanksgiving we can continue to pray prayers of request but the prayer that we need to really focus on is repentance you can read in the book of revelation about the seven churches five out of those seven churches had moved away from god's purpose 
They had been filled with the Holy Ghost. They had been baptized in Jesus' name. They were the church. The Bible calls them the church. God called them the church. But they weren't saved. And he called them to a place of repentance. And so, here we are at the end of time. Here we are watching so many things that were prophesied come into pass. Dovetailing, coming all together to where we can see the end from here. And it's important that we be a church that is humble. A church that loves people. And the only way we can do that is if we will be a church that repents. Ask God to forgive us of just being so stinking fleshy. Ask God to forgive us of being so stinking human. That we have catered so much to our flesh that it's difficult for us to operate in the spirit. God, forgive us for being selfish. Forgive us, oh God, for us not putting your kingdom first. Forgive us, oh God, for just striving to make ourselves comfortable on this, word, on this earth that you're going to burn up. That we're striving to be comfortable in a world that you're going to destroy in just a few years. Help us, oh God, to get our focus right. Help us, oh God, to get our focus right. To love your kingdom and to love the people that you want in your kingdom. To reach for them. To save them. To fulfill your purpose in the world. Help us God. Forgive us God. Give us direction I pray. Help us Jesus to reach for you like we've never reached before. Help us oh God to strive to be like you like we've never done before. So that we can get to the place that if we are crucified we can still pray that they be forgiven. In Jesus' name, amen.